How's it going guys? My name is Trent and we're at the world's largest creative conference in Las Vegas, Adobe Max. Now in addition to a whole bunch of new apps and features, including the very impressive Adobe Sensei, Adobe has brought in four of the world's leading creatives, Jonathan Adler, Annie Griffiths, Mark Bronson, and John Favreau. Let's have a listen to some of the things they had to say at the conference. about a potter, this is what you would think of, right? And this is the work you would imagine that he would be making. Um, a typical potter is sequestered in a garret in Vermont, making sad pots that he tries to hawk at rain-soaked craft fairs. Um, it's a sad life. It wasn't my dreams, and I never wanted to be that potter, I just wanted to be a potter. Um, and so when I first started, I decided to make pottery that looked like this. Pottery that was clean and graphic and uplifting um, and really was a reflection of me. I woke up one morning and I thought, there's a huge problem in the world. Why aren't there any mugs that are based on iconic rap stars? <laughs> and so I raced to my studio and I made some mugs. Um, I did like a Kanye, and I did a Run DMC, um, and there they are in real life. Um, another day I woke up and I thought, hold on, grenades are beautiful. Like grenades are incredible <laughs> forms. They're organic, they have like this incredible shape, and their, their texture is really beautiful. So I raced to my studio, um, and I made a group of phases that were inspired by grenades. That's moi at the wheel. Those are the pots in process. Um, and here they are finished. They kind of captured that menacing spirit of grenades. Um, and again, I woke up and thought, this has to happen. I think that all of the ideas that I've talked about seem sort of preposterous. They seem like really insane. But of course, when I had them, I thought, these ideas are incredible because I had them. These are my ideas, so they're fabulous. So that's the, that's the very beginning of my creative process. The rest is where my self-loathing comes in. Um, I think that you need to be able to go from that little moment of inspiration, and then you need to start to put that into the world. And then once you start, you need to think, oh my god, this is going to be a failure. This is absolutely going to be a disaster, because I am doomed to fail, because I'm me. There are so many reasons why you shouldn't do something, and of course they're correct. The truth is that every idea is a very bad idea. It really is. Like, you know, every idea is a terrible idea, and um, to make anything, you really need to either be so dumb or so full of undeserved self-esteem that you don't know you're dumb. <laughs> That's, that's what I was interested in. And that's what I was trying to find wherever I worked. And I worked you know, first a little bit in the United States and then started traveling. And what our job really was was to take pictures of things either that everybody knew about and, and do them in a new way or to go to some fantastical place and take pictures of things people had never seen. But as time went on, I kind of had this longing to, to seek more than beauty in my photographs. I really became more interested in the people than the place. And I wanted to show um, the connective tissue among all cultures and also the things that set us apart. So, of course, Argentina. This is in Mexico where a family was so thrilled that their daughter and her 15th birthday, her quinceanera, but they painted their whole house pink. I wanted those kinds of insights into cultures and people and things we share. And I also wanted to push back against um, generalized, you know, really, really offensive and inaccurate portrayals of other people. I can't think of anybody who in the early years was more fortunate than I was. And yet all of us, at a certain point, come to either a crossroads 
or in my case, a train wreck, that um, makes us have to think really hard and make decisions about our future. So my perfect storm came in my mid-50s. This is my family that I grew up with. And you can see, of course, fashion icon that I am. I'm the one in the fuzzy white hat. Um, but in a single season, my mother took the deep dive into Alzheimer's. And my 20-year marriage evaporated in a humiliating way. And you can only have a pity party for so long. I remember reading an article at that time that said basically a woman in my situation should just get some cats and a vibrator and <laughs> call it a day. Well, sadly, I'm allergic to cats. So, I started doing a And I had learned early on that the most creative people on earth are poor women. And so I started really focusing on programs that empowered women and their children in the developing world. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I knew that they were the key, that they were the best investment we could make in our shared future. And the thing that, you know, doesn't get talked about much in this world is that it's working. There's less poverty. More girls are getting an education. It's not all doom and gloom. And it's because these people are magnificent. You know, when an artist or a singer goes in, no matter how great they might be, or how many times you see them on TV bouncing out a song, when they go into that booth about to record, they're in the most sort of insecure, vulnerable place that there's they'll ever be in. So it's your job to just make them feel like they can do anything. It's, I'm lucky as well to work with these incredible artists, so sometimes it comes from their thing, or like, so, sometimes it's like conversation. I remember with when I first met Amy Winehouse and we were working together, we were getting to know each other. We were walking around Soho in New York and she told me a story about, you know, it's a tough time in her life and she said, uh, you know, my family came over and they tried to make me go to rehab and I was like, no, no, no. And I thought like, <laughs> as much as this is a really right. important sensitive, thing, I don't want right. to be yeah. insensitive that just the way you said that right there is quite catchy, like would you be open to do it? A song. And now, to be honest, like in light of having known everything she went through, and maybe going through after seeing the movie, like not to get too like deep, but like I might have thought twice about it, like, making light of that. But a lot of the time, you know, she was just so inspirational. She'd have ideas for a piano line, and just she'd just throw out a melody or show me a riff on the guitar, and like songs would just roll from there. Do you hear records and you think? I could have done that better, or oh, I would have liked to, I would have done it this way, or I wish they would have done something like that. I think a really good barometer of whether I love a record or not is if, like, the minute I hear it, you're just, like, so jealous, you're like, damn, I wish I did that, or, like, I can't believe I didn't think of that, or they beat me to it, or whatever. Um, yeah, sometimes I can't help listen to music without being like, oh, I wonder what Mike being is on the snare drum, or, like, I can't, I could never listen to music during, we'll say, romantic times. Right. Because, uh, <laughs> because I think you geek out a little on what's happening in the back. I wouldn't be able to contact you, like, the drummer's not keeping time, I just think <laughs> they should have, uh, I don't know, done their vocal, it's, it's not in her right register. Um, so, so yeah, I do, the brain is sort of always on, but I think that that's also the good thing, because when you're sort of a creative, you always have to be like a little bit switched on because you don't know at what point if it's just like he shares the shower walking down the street or hearing a song like in the post office what's going to like trigger something right oh yeah like you know the light bulb moment yeah do you think the technology and the accessibility and the availability of all this makes music making better compared to say years ago when you were doing it definitely a more analog style um, yeah, I think that there's an amazing thing about like the democratization of music that like anybody in their bedroom using a computer program could make something that it could not only be good, but that they can upload to the internet and can resonate within culture and get to everybody, you right. know, as fast as it, as, as it, as it can. Um, I still feel for my own style of the kind of music that I like to make, it's about 
having some kind of human touch in that, but then the technology that you can use to then chop it around and edit it and all this kind of stuff, when you use both of those things concurrently, you know, the kind of human, human aspect of ideas and that kind of thing, performance, makes with what technology can do then, and you kind of like, those are the best of both worlds. And that's coming back a bit more now too, isn't it? There was a period, I think, 10, 12 years ago where it was very synthetic. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of human uh, participation yeah. in the actual period. I think so. You know, there's tons of things with technology and auto tune and like whatever, like just, to, you know, the way Kanye West uses it and stuff that are really exciting. And to use technology to push things forward is great. Um, but then the idea of like, you know, when you see a girl on stage belting out a song that, that sends chills down your spine, that's, that's something still about human voice and the way it resonates in our bodies that's really special. Yeah. I'm just turning 51 today, actually. It's his birthday! Definitely more comfortable with stuff I've grown up with. However, to turn away from something because it's new, you have to know that that's, it, it, that's your initial knee jerk is to is to shy away from the unfamiliar. Uh, however, the tools that are available now are so exciting, and the and the way to connect with an audience, because I think at its core, it's really about people, right? Technology is often it's very easy to get hung up on the tech, but really, it's a it's just a means, a medium through which you connect. Whether it's communicating on your phone or through you know video chatting or making a movie or presenting something out there that you created that, that ends up connecting with other people. And so what's nice now is you don't have the gatekeepers that you had when we started off. There are a lot of, you know, a lot of the What does that mean? It means that when I wanted to make a movie, I had to either get cast in a movie, have somebody buy a screenplay from me, or go through a lot of trouble to raise the money to buy film and processing and uh, editing equipment. It, it cost Know, even on the cheap, Swingers was on the cheap, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. You could do that now for thousands of dollars. Yeah. As a storyteller, as somebody who wants to entertain and connect and, 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 uh, and, and be creative and come up with things, right? Storytelling, you, you just have to adjust for each medium what type of story you would tell. I would never do Chef as a, you know, as a big, uh, wide, wide release. <laughs> right, I wouldn't do it as a, I wouldn't do it like Jungle Book or Lion King. Uh, but I, I love working on Chef as much as I love working on the bigger stuff. And for VR, it's even more complicated the way you tell the story because it's an interactive environment. So you can't just repurpose and port things to other media. Yeah. You have to look for the opportunities that that new technology affords us. And, and the marriage of technology and storytelling, especially the old myths and the old stories, has been the recipe for success for a long time, whether it's George Lucas or Walt Disney. These were always, these are people who are with Jim Cameron, these are people that are fascinated with technology and are looking for opportunities to bring themes that connect all of us on a very, you know, primal level. I went to the premiere of the new Thor movie, and I saw it, of course, at, for me, at the premiere with a full house, and when something's funny and exciting, it's great to have that energy. But there are some things that I'm just as happy to watch at home and watch it for a long stretch of time where I couldn't sit in the theater for as long as I would want to binge a show if I want to watch a whole season of something. Yeah. And I think it's great that we have the option to do both. Or go to a revival house, like Elf plays every year at Christmas time. Yeah. And, and, and the idea that they you know. and I, I've introed it a lot. You know, sometimes I'll intro a screening and, and, so, and I'll sit through that. There's nothing I don't know that's in that movie. What I'm liking is parents bringing their kids yeah. to see this film, or um, people seeing it for the first time, or people who now love the film. Because when it first comes out, you're in the theater biting your nails, hoping they're gonna like the movie. Once people have decided they like something, they view it a different way and the energy is different. And so I think there's room for everything, and I think because of social media, people with specific tastes and likes can gather and form larger groups. And that wasn't available when I was in high school. There was a group of people who played Dungeons and Dragons or people who liked Star Trek or that. But it was a couple of kids. You get all those kids getting together, you got Comic-Con. You know what I mean? And that's a fun thing. So I think there's more opportunity now for people to explore very disparate tastes and 
share things creatively and, and meet up with other people and collaborate, which I think is at the core of making storytelling in, in a way that we're equating to filmmaking. It's, it's groups of people collaborating with one vision to tell the story. We were talking backstage about where we both went to school. There was a lot of really smart people there, and I wasn't a great student. I mean, I got by, but I found that I do much better if it's an area that I feel passionate about. And when I love something, I'm a different person. I'm, I perform on a whole other level. And so I have the luxury and the, you know, and the experience to say, um, I only want to work on stuff I love. And if I do that, you're going to see a whole one aspect of me. And, but, if, but when I worked the best job, then I wasn't excited and I wasn't a great employee. Um, we came from an academic background. I was dissuaded from getting into a creative field because the odds were so bad. But I would argue that if you're operating at 100% of your capacity and, it, and, and you have a more limited percentage of success based on the field you're choosing, you're better off than if you're operating at 40% in a field that you have a better success rate. And, and as I am a father now, and I have kids, and I have people that I work with, that's advice that I think um, I, I wish I would have gotten. And so, especially in this day and age where you don't know what the job market's going to be like in 20 years, follow your bliss. If, if you're working really hard at something, that's going to lead to something really good. Even if it's not the thing you think it's going to lead to, it will get you to the next step and the next level. Because it's all about learning, and there's no excuse not to learn now.